Welcome on board for another power supply project. This is a wide input range, non-isolated flyback DC to DC converter. The input voltage from this terminal ranges from 70 volts up to 230 volts DC and the output from this terminal is fixed at 12 volts with a continuous current of up to 400 milliamps. The board is easy to build and quite practical for many applications. You can also lower the input voltage, but the maximum output current will be reduced since the controller has a limited duty cycle. The controller desk chip is the UCC2888-1 from Texas Instruments. Here is the snubber circuit, the E19 transformer in the center and the output rectification and noise reduction stages. Let me show you the back side of the board. Look at this circular isolation gap around this pin as well as these vias. I will explain these in more details in the schematic and PCB section. Let's move on. All right, this is Altium developed software that I used to design this schematic, this PCB layout and also this PCB layout. But you might ask, what's the benefit of this Altium develop? What's the catch? What's in it for me? Altium develop offers many features, but one stands out. It makes teamwork easy, especially on complex PCB projects. Imagine you are on a team where one person works on power supply, another designs digital circuits, someone else handles RF parts such as Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, LoRa, and another team member creates component libraries and prepares the bill of materials. If you rely on traditional methods such as email, shared folders, screenshots, and PDFs, things get messy. You end up with a bunch of schematic and PCB files, misunderstandings, and frustration. This will delay your project, stress the team members, and affect the company's revenue and reputation. The difference is obvious, so I won't explain more. Follow this link in the YouTube video description, sign up on the Altium website, and test it with your one month free legal license. With that sign up, you can also download the project files from this link. All right, let me talk about the schematic. Let me zoom in on the design. There we go. Uh, the schematic uh, looks simple and easy to build, even for beginners. Let me start from the left side of the schematic, this DC input terminal. C1 and C2 are bypass capacitors used to stabilize the controller and reduce noise. R1, D1, and C4 form the RCD snubber network, which protects the controller's internal MOSFET from high voltage spikes and transients. If these components are selected correctly, they also help reduce conducted EMI. IC1 is the controller from Texas Instruments. The typical switching frequency is 62 kHz and the maximum duty cycle is between 45 and 55 percent. It has an integrated 700 volts MOSFET and includes protection against short circuit, overcurrent, and over temperature. C3 is an SMD decoupling capacitor placed close to the IC. The ferrite transformer is an E1985 core, which I will discuss in the next section. D2 is a Schottky diode used for high frequency rectification, while C5 and C6 are output capacitors used to reduce ripple and noise. R2 and R3 are feedback resistors that set the output voltage. Since the input and output grounds are common, 
we don't need an optocoupler in this design. Finally, D3 is an LED that indicates the power supply is on and running. It also acts as a 5 milliamps dummy load to help stabilize the output voltage. Let's move on to the PCB layout. I have actually designed two PCB versions for this circuit. This one with a true hole transformer and this one with an SMD transformer. The SMD version provides better grounding but the choice depends on the application. Let me show you the difference. If I enable this single layer mode, so this is top and this is bottom. For this one, this is top and this is bottom. Do you see the bottom layer? So let me start to explain the PCB for the true hole one because this is the one I actually followed for my PCB layout, I mean the assembled board. So that should be fine and fits the screen. The first and maybe the most important point in this type of design is the connection between the controller's switching pin and the transformer. This trace must be short and wide because it carries large switching spikes. Any unnecessary copper in this area acts like an antenna and becomes a strong source of radiated emission. The isolation gap or creepage area around the transformer pin along with the clearance on the backside follows high voltage safety rules. The second key point is the snubber network. I recommend using SMD components at least for the resistor and placing the RCD snubber as close as possible to the transformer. This C3 is the decoupling capacitor. It should be placed as close as possible to the controller. It's also better to supply all primary side components directly from the positive pin of the bulk capacitor, just like I've done here. It's a minor trick, but good practice in SMPS layout. On the transformer secondary side, the loop area formed by the Schottky diode and the first output capacitor to ground should be as small as possible. The ground pin of this capacitor should have a low impedance path to the transformer's ground pin. These vias provide a low impedance return path for the circuit and connect the top and bottom ground planes, helping to prevent ground loops, reduce noise, and minimize radiated emission. Anyway, that's it. Let's move on to the transformer winding section. All right, I think this picture shows all necessary details since it clearly illustrates the fried core, the bobbin type, and how the transformer should be wound. For example, the primary winding consists of 81 turns of 0.2 mm magnet wire. The wires are soldered to these pins and the white bobbin pin is left unconnected. This is the estimated gap size. In my case, the measured leakage inductance was around 24 microhenries. All right, welcome to the testing section. I prepared this test setup using these instruments and here is the power supply under test. If you hear a noise in the background is because is because of this transformer because I wound this transformer by hand and such a noise is normal when you wind these type of small transformers by hand. By the way, I don't have access to a high voltage DC power supply, so instead I use this variable AC transformer or a variac along with this uh, board to convert the variable AC to DC. This board is actually the input stage from a dead switching power supply. But if you have access to a high voltage DC power supply, it's much better than this because 
This is the sea, but with tons of ripple. This multimeter shows the input voltage, and this DC load applies the maximum continuous, 350 milliamps, uh, to the power supply. It means around 4.4 watts of continuous power. Uh, I test the supply across the input voltage range from 70 volts to 230 volts. Right now the input is 70 volts, no problem whatsoever. Let's increase it and go to the upper limit, 230, and we examine the output voltage and current. So, 210. 225 and 230. So no problem whatsoever. The output voltage and current stays stable within the range. This is a pass for this power supply. Now I want to observe the input voltage spikes and ringing at the upper input limit which is 230. So I am going to connect this oscilloscope probe to the transformer primary to measure the peak to peak voltage and examine the ringing waveform. But is it safe to connect it? Yes, because the AC here, the AC input is fed through an isolation transformer. So remember the setup because I will only record the oscilloscope screen. All right, here is the oscilloscope screen and the waveform pretty clear and sharp. The measurement says the maximum peak to peak voltage, actually the worst case scenario is around 340 volts, which stays well below the maximum drain source voltage of the MOSFET. I was thinking to receive some noisy waveform because the transformer makes some noise, but it is clear that noise is not related to the windings. It's related that somewhere in the transformer is loose and the transformer vibrates and makes some noise. Uh, so this is a pass for this number, but let's examine this edge, this ringing edge. Let me play with the times division knob. Do you see that? I don't see any sharp edges on this pulse. Let me play with that again. No sharp edges. It means no high frequency element. So you should so you shouldn't have any problem with the conducted emission test. So this is a pass for this power supply. I hope you liked this video. Don't forget to share and subscribe. We will do something else in the next video.